Hey, it's Seth. Molly and I have something important to tell you. As you're about to hear, we swapped out an episode to present a breaking story that may prove to be quite significant. But before we get to that, we just wanted to remind you that Big Picture Science couldn't exist without listener support. And we're now on Patreon for those of you who choose to donate that way. For just a few bucks, Patreon supporters get exclusive rewards like bonus material, thanks from us in the podcast, and the chance to meet Seth. Wow. And perhaps most importantly, you get episodes like the one you're about to hear. And again, we couldn't do it without you. So please join us today at patreon.com slash bigpicturescience, and thank you. Thanks. Back in the day, when news was primarily mostly printed, occasionally reporters would get wind of a story of such significance that someone would shout, Stop the presses! Well, we had an equivalent of that last week here at Big Picture Science. As we were busily putting the finishing touches on an episode planned for this week, we heard of a research result that was too good, simply too significant, at least potentially, to pass up. So we stopped our presses to follow it and bring it to you. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute. In this episode, we examine the recent report that scientists have detected a gas in the atmosphere of a neighboring planet that could be an indicator of biology. In other words, they may have found evidence of alien life. Some parts of what they discovered are certain, others have qualifiers, so obviously there's a lot to discuss. What exactly did the scientists find? And what does it mean in the hunt for life beyond Earth? This episode, Life on Venus? In order to gauge the significance of the discovery that scientists claim to have made, we want to understand what it is they found. And to help explain that, we refer to a research paper that came out late in 2019 in the journal Astrobiology. The paper was about a gas called phosphine, PH3 for you chemistry types. The lead author had spent years studying it. I'm Clara Souza Silva and I'm a quantum astrochemist at MIT. I spend my time using quantum chemistry to understand how molecules interact with light so that we can one day detect them on an exoplanet. We have a feeling you'll want to get to know this gas, phosphine, a little better. Oh, sure, it may not be as well known as gases like oxygen or carbon dioxide, but it may steal their limelight. So how about an introduction? Clara, I have to confess that before this week, I hadn't heard of the gas phosphine. And um, the more I learned about it, the more interesting it became and what jumped out at me is the fact that it is found in swamps and in penguin dung. Uh, why is phosphine found in those places? What do they have in common? So when, when I first got to know phosphine, I felt similar to you, which is why is phosphine important at all? And when I first did get to know phosphine, it was only known for two things. One, as a marker for convection in Jupiter and Saturn. And there we see it because it gets dredged from the hellish depths of those planets to a point where we can see it. And on Earth, it is only found in some pretty peculiar situations. And, and that is either in places like swamps or marshlands, uh, lake sediments, um, the intestinal tract of fish, the intestinal tract of babies, and actually the feces and farts of most animals. And there's something that these ecosystems have in common, which is that they're all anaerobic. They're all oxygen poor. And this makes complete sense because phosphine is otherwise known for being a horrific molecule, a molecule that kills effectively, smells terribly, and is highly flammable, but is only toxic to oxygen metabolism. So those ecosystems you just described don't fear phosphine because they don't love oxygen. Why do you think penguin dung was jumping out? I mean, that's a weird thing to say if you took that 
by itself, but <laughs> why were the reporters emphasizing penguin dung? We expect phosphine to be in the guts of most animals. And penguin dung is one that gets brought up because it's one of the most cited papers that mentions phosphine's relationship with biology. I should point out, none of these papers are widely cited, as you may imagine, but some good, laudable scientists put enormous amounts of effort looking into badger excrement and penguin excrement and found phosphine in those ecosystems, if you can call them that. And I'm extremely thankful to them because it must have been thankless work. Um, but yes, of the few poorly cited papers, that one got a tiny bit more of attention and, and a lot of people have come across it. So to be clear, phosphine is, um, is a toxic gas for anything that likes oxygen, but for anaerobic microbes that don't depend on oxygen, um, is phosphine a useful molecule or is it just a byproduct of their metabolism? So we expect it to be a byproduct of their metabolism, but we actually don't know what that metabolic pathway might be. We don't fully understand why anaerobic life makes phosphine. We just know that it does. So there may be organisms that breathe oxygen like penguins and humans, but it is the microbes in their gut or the microbes that are in swamps that don't need that oxygen. They are anaerobic microbes. Um, any chance that uh, phosphine could be produced by non-biology? Could it be abiotic? Uh, you mentioned Jupiter and Saturn. We don't believe there is life in Jupiter and Saturn. How was phosphine produced there? So phosphine is a really difficult molecule to make, and that makes it very good as a biosignature because it has low false positives for life. But like most molecules, you can still make it with enough effort. So on Earth, it is produced at a cost by anaerobic life and through human ingenuity industrially. Now, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort to make phosphine, which is why it doesn't easily happen spontaneously. But there are places in the universe that are pretty extreme. And one of those places is the hot depths of Jupiter and Saturn. These places can reach sufficiently high temperatures and more importantly, sufficiently high hydrogen pressures to actually make phosphine thermodynamically favorable. And so phosphine doesn't easily happen, but with enough effort, you can make it. So even finding phosphine on Jupiter and Saturn was still strange because it can't be formed where we see it. It is just in that case, evidence of extreme environments deep down that are being dredged up to where we can see them. Terrestrial planets like Earth cannot have these environments with high hydrogen pressure and high temperatures. And so phosphine can only be made through other means. And the only other mean we know within a terrestrial planet is life. You use the term biosignature a little bit earlier. Um, what is a biosignature and what is the role that it plays when we look for life beyond Earth? So there are many definitions of biosignature, and the simplest one is a molecule produced by life. Now, that, that is a totally a reasonable um, definition, but I find it not particularly helpful. Because when you're thinking about, about a biosignature, you want to know not just if it is produced by life, but whether you could detect it after it is produced by life. And you want to know if you do detect this biosignature, whether it could be produced in other non-biological means that could somehow confuse your detection of life. And so I think it's really helpful to consider not just what a biosignature is, but what would make a good biosignature. And one of the reasons I love phosphine so much is that it is a good biosignature. It is produced by life, as long as it's not oxygen-loving life. It is uh, emitted into the atmosphere and can survive there to a point where it's detectable. It has a beautiful molecular fingerprint that makes it easy to detect, and that's what I worked on my whole PhD. And then it has a really important quality, which is it's really hard to make. And so it is difficult for it to spontaneously show up in an atmosphere without the intervention of life. You said that the molecular fingerprint of phosphine is beautiful. What makes the molecular fingerprint beautiful? So I, I am obviously biased since this is the bulk of my work at figuring out this fingerprint. But the reason I think it's beautiful is that it's quite clear. And so it's easy to distinguish from other atmospheric constituents. A lot of molecules, the way they interact with light, although technically unique, at low resolutions, they can be easily confused by other neighboring molecules. 
So if you see acetylene in an atmosphere, it can be easily confused for hydrogen cyanide. If you see isoprene, it can be easily confused by uh, methane. But phosphine has pretty unique spectral signatures, and so it's easy to tell it apart from other constituents, and that makes it easier to detect in faraway planets, even if it's in small quantities, which it's likely to be because it's so hard to make. And that spectral signature is detected through instrumentation that looks at the wavelength of the light that is coming from the atmosphere of other planetary bodies, for example. And each uh, molecule, like phosphine or another molecule, like oxygen, absorbs a certain wavelength and emits a certain wavelength of light. That's the relationship between light and this molecular fingerprint? That's exactly right. Uh, And so every molecule has its own spectral fingerprint, and it's more than just specific single wavelengths. So my work on phosphine was to calculate every single feature that uh, phosphine leaves in in an impression on light. And I calculated 16.8 billion features that are uniquely assigned to phosphine. So it was quite a lot of work, and every molecule has a similar number of unique features and some of them are very big some are very small some are clumped together but that's that's the scale of the problem 16.8 billion yes and are they itemized in a list somewhere on a hard drive somewhere in your house one two three 16.8 yes they are and they're all cataloged yes (laughs) no i'm not took me four years and a lot of sweat and tears. Uh, Clara, you came out, you and your team came out with a paper at the end of 2019 in the journal Astrobiology. And what was the fundamental takeaway of your work on phosphine that you presented in that paper? So it was effectively two parts. One was to build this case that phosphine is indeed associated with uh, non-oxygen loving life on Earth and by association elsewhere. And once that was done, it was about working out where we could detect it and how. And we were considering all matters of hypothetical exoplanets in our galactic neighborhood, where phosphine might be produced happily by its anaerobic biosphere, and then detectable using near-future telescopes. And the main takeaway was, if you detect phosphine on any terrestrial planet, then it must come for life, because no detectable flux could be created by a non-biological means. And we came to this conclusion by considering every process we could think of that could possibly create phosphine, uh, from phosphite and phosphate reduction to lightning strikes, meteoritic delivery, volcanoes, and even less and less plausible mechanisms, and none could create sufficient amounts of phosphine for it to ever be detected on an exoplanet. And so we concluded it was a robust biosignature for life. So finally, um, just to be clear, the conclusion of your paper at the end of 2019 was that the detection of phosphine in the atmosphere of another body would be a strong indication of life. Uh, Would it be a clear indication? Is it a definitive indication of life? Only with the knowledge that we currently have, which is admittedly lacking. There are signals we could receive that are unequivocal, you know, a radio signal uh, with prime numbers, that would be unequivocal. Uh, Detection of CFCs in an atmosphere, that would be unequivocal and also slightly depressing because they would have found pollution as well. Um, So there are molecules that are more unequivocal. But phosphine, with our understanding of chemistry, thermodynamics and atmospheric physics, seems to be unable to be made without the intervention of life. Clara Souza Silva, thank you so much for speaking with us. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. Clara Souza Silva is a quantum astrochemist in the Department of Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences at MIT. Now that we've met the gas with the beautiful molecular fingerprint, phosphine, and learned of its relationship to biology, our story picks up momentum. Our team found signs of phosphine gas in the atmosphere of Venus. Next, planetary scientist Sarah Seeger on what her team found and what it means in the hunt for life beyond Earth. This episode is Life on Venus on Big Picture Science.
Hello again. Got your fill of phosphines yet? Well, maybe you can't be a life form in the clouds of Venus, but if you become a Patreon supporter of the show, you could become a, a protozoa, or a tardigrade, or a dolphin, or maybe even a velociraptor. And you would join the other protozoa, tardigrades, dolphins, and velociraptors who support Big Picture Science on Patreon. They all went to patreon.com slash bigpicturescience and signed up to help us out. And they'll be getting a little something in return. As could you, like exclusive polling, bonus material, and thanks in the podcast, and more. All phosphine free. (laughs) Patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. Thanks for your support. Thank you. The exciting news that scientists have detected phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus could have blockbuster implications. As we've heard from Dr. Sousa Silva, phosphine gas is highly correlated with the presence of life. So this means that news of its discovery on Earth's twin is not like the news reports of the detection of other signatures of life, like, you know, the methane that occasionally wafts across the landscapes of Mars. Sure. I mean, that's exciting, but we know methane can be produced by geological processes too, not just by biological. The paper that details the study that led to the detection of Venusian phosphine gas appears in the journal Nature Astronomy, and its title is Phosphine Gas in the Cloud Decks of Venus. The lead author is Jane Greaves. One of the co-authors is Clara Souza Silva, whom we've just heard from, Another author is MIT physicist and planetary scientist Sarah Seeger. Sarah, from your team's paper, we see the names of two telescopes involved in your study of the cloud decks of Venus, the Alma Telescope down in Chile and the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii. How did you use them to detect phosphine gas? Well, our team lead, Professor Jane Greaves, is a radio astronomer. All molecules absorb and emit radiation. And in particular, molecules rotate. Each molecule, if you will, has its own fingerprint of absorption wavelengths where it interacts with light. And using these two telescopes at millimeter wavelengths, she led the observations that detected phosphine. Well, oxygen is an obvious biosignature gas, right? I mean, the oxygen in our atmosphere, 20% of the atmosphere or so is, is oxygen, but that's because there's life on Earth. There's photosynthesis on Earth. Uh, Methane is also another good biosignature, but the problem with those gases, as examples, is that, yeah, they're produced by living organisms, uh, by biology, if you will, but they're also produced by geology, you know, volcanic activity and stuff like that. So just because you found oxygen in somebody's atmosphere, I mean, that doesn't mean they have plants. Well, there is a really strong case for oxygen being made by life. It's true there are false positives, but they're pretty contrived. Methane, on the other hand, it's, it's correct. It is produced by life and also by geophysical processes. For example, on Earth, our mid-ocean ridges emit methane gas. Well, phosphine actually has another, a third characteristic of a great biosignature gas, because on a planet like Earth or Venus, it has no false positives. With phosphine, there's no known way to produce a lot of phosphine, to produce the amounts that we've detected in Venus's atmosphere. We thought about volcanoes, lightning strikes, and we thought about meteoritic delivery to the atmosphere. We worked through photochemistry, other atmospheric chemistry, surface, subsurface chemistry, and no known process can produce enough phosphine to explain the measurements. Maybe you can give us an idea of how much phosphine we're talking about. I mean, uh, well, we're talking a... about what you'll consider a very small amount, 20 parts per billion. Per billion. Per billion. Mm-hmm. But this phosphine was, as I understand it, was found by two different radio telescopes, one in uh, Hawaii and uh, one in the Atacama Desert or high above the Atacama Desert in Chile. So this is not a case of, uh, you know, mistaken identity. I mean, you know that this is phosphine. Right. Well, we do consider our signal robust because we did find it with two different telescopes using two different data analysis pipelines. And we're confident this is phosphine because there doesn't appear to be any other molecule we can think of or that's present in the Venus atmosphere that has an absorption feature at the wavelength where we detected a signal. So, all right, phosphine, the detection is solid. The fact that it's produced by biology is well known. 
does this mean you found life on Venus? Is it, can, can you swear on your next month's paycheck that that's the case? We are definitely not claiming we have found life on Venus. We have this very unusual detection of a gas that doesn't belong. There could be two explanations. One, that there is some unknown chemical process that can somehow produce enough phosphine. The second is that there's life. You know, both are kind of out there crazy that need a lot more follow-up work. Okay, but uh, do you have a predilection for one or the other at this point? No, no. I, it wouldn't be good science to just speculate wildly. But you can speculate, Seth. You can, you can share what, what you think. Well, listen, I mean, this, this thing has a long lever arm, as they say. I mean, if this is life, this is the first time that we have conclusively found life in space beyond Earth. So this is a very important result. Uh, let me back up a little bit for those people who don't really know too much about Venus because they've never been there. Uh, the surface temperature on a you know warm day on Venus is about 900 degrees Fahrenheit. That's also the temperature on a cool day. The atmosphere is like, what, 100 times thicker than Earth's, and it's mostly carbon dioxide laced with sulfuric acid. And now there's this tiny little bit of phosphine. We should make clear that this phosphine has not been found on the surface of Venus. This is up in the atmosphere, right? It's not on the ground. Right, right. Yes, it's found in the atmosphere, correct. And, and about how high up? About 50 to 60 kilometers above the surface of Venus, so pretty high up. Okay, that's, that, that's higher than Mount Everest, that's for sure. Right. But, but, but that high up, of course, the deal there is that if you're that high up in the Venusian atmosphere, the temperatures are about the same as you would find, I don't know, in New England. Not too hot, not too cold, right? Right, right. And the pressures are also similar to what we have here on Earth's surface. Years ago, Carl Sagan suggested that there could be floating microbes in Jupiter's atmosphere as well, but that was kind of ruled out when we learned that the atmosphere of Jupiter, in any case, churns up and down, you know, these vertical winds, if you will, and that would subject these little guys to intolerable extremes of heat and cold. Why wouldn't the same be true on Venus? Well, it could be, but actually, associated with this work, I worked out a hypothesis, a life cycle, if you will, for life on Venus. And what I and my team postulated was that, first of all, we argued that life needs to reside inside the liquid droplets. But as the droplets collide and grow over time scale of about months, those droplets will get heavy enough to rain out of the atmosphere. So they will fall down. But as they travel downwards to higher and higher temperatures, the liquid sulfuric acid will evaporate, potentially leaving a dried out microbe, a spore, if you will. And the spore, being lighter than that more massive droplet, would stop falling. And it could partially populate a known lower haze layer on Venus. There's this known haze layer that is known to be stable, stagnant. We don't know what it's made of, though. So my idea is that these spores could populate, just be suspended, until they can get updrafted, and those will go back to the temperate layer, the layer that's just the right temperature for life. And they can act as cloud condensation nuclei, collecting sulfuric acid becoming ensconced in a droplet again, rehydrating and starting the process over again. What would be the reaction, do you think, if it turns out that uh, this phosphine actually indicates uh, living, living organisms in the atmosphere of uh, Venus? If there truly is life in the Venus atmosphere, and if we were able to show that it's independent from life on Earth, it would mean that there's one example of a second genesis of life. And why that's so exciting, that's so wondrous, is because it gives us hope that there's life in so many places around planets orbiting other stars other than our sun. And that will just fuel our whole search for life in the universe. How do we prove this for real, Sarah? I mean, is there anything that can be done short of dropping a probe into the Venusian atmosphere and simply taking samples? Well, you hit the nail on the head there, Seth. We'd like to find a way to go to Venus specifically to look for gases like phosphine and methane and other gases. We'd like to someday send a balloon to Venus, like the Russian's Vega balloon, that it was coated with Teflon to prevent harm from sulfuric acid, and it floated in the atmosphere for a couple of days. So we'd like to go there, sample the atmosphere directly, ingest the liquid droplets, have a microscope, and see what's there. Could it be I mean, that something like that could have contaminated, could have seeded 
the Venusian atmosphere? I mean, there have been probes uh, down to Venus. The Russians had them back in the 70s. You mentioned this balloon. They're inevitably carrying some microbes to Venus. Could it be that what we're actually discovering here are just earthlings that have been transplanted? I always love that idea that microbes can survive on spacecraft through outer space. It's, it's just amazing. But Seth, I can assure you that there's no possible way that any life on Earth could contaminate and survive in the Venus atmosphere. The liquid droplets are made of sulfuric acid with a little bit of water. And it's so deathly to life, like our DNA would dissolve in sulfuric acid. Pretty much most life forms um, will come apart completely in sulfuric acid. Well, finally, Sarah, uh, how excited is the team? I mean, are they booking their flights to Stockholm or are they uh, trying to, uh, you know, remain calm in the face of uncertainty? A bit of both, I'd say. The team is incredibly excited that we're able to share this with the rest of the world. We've been working on this for a few years, actually. Professor Jane Greaves' first proposal was, I want to say, back in 2015 or 2016. So it's been a long time coming. We're excited to tell the world we're even more excited that this will fuel more research, more work on Venus. It'll bring Venus as what I like to think of the neglected sibling back into the limelight. Sarah Seeger, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you, Seth. Sarah Seeger is a professor in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And later in the show, we'll hear ideas about how biology not only could have arisen on Venus, but make its way up into those clouds. But first, a word of caution about this recent discovery. I am Nedoy Cabral. I am a planetary scientist, and I am the chief scientist at the SETI Institute. Well, Natalie, I think we both lived long enough to see claims of extraterrestrial life before. I mean, there were the Viking landers on Mars in the 1970s, the wow signal, the Allen Hills Martian meteorite. I mean, there have been others. Do you think this one could be it? You know, I'm just like everybody else. I, I want to have an answer and I want to see a biosignature. As far as the paper and the new publication is concerned, I have my reservation. Obviously, the authors are having reservations as well, which is good. But I think that life is not the only possibility here. Well, you can't just tease us. You know, they have been careful. And I noticed that the press release from Nature magazine actually didn't even mention life as a possible explanation for this phosphine. What sort of cautions would you put out there? What sort of things could be misleading us? I don't think there is any, any way this paper can mislead anybody. I think that, as you said, the authors were extremely careful. I would go first as an astrobiologist, which is the environment itself. What you see here is the presence of phosphorus. And, and this is really the thing that it's interesting, right? But at the same time, you see an environment that's highly uh, volcanic. It's extremely hot. It's uh, extremely acidic. And there are some interesting papers. I went through uh, uh, those papers and I look back at them that had those signals when I saw uh, the nature paper because there are some indication of eruption way back in Hawaii in the 80s that had those signals that has phosphate presence in aerosols. It might not be exactly the same signal, but then the authors had to decipher the origin of the phosphorus. And so they went back to demonstrating that it was part of the processes in the magma and in the volcanism itself. So if you look at Venus and uh, interaction between sulfur and uh, between phosphate, then you start to see interesting trends here. Venus is highly rich in, vol in volcanism. It also has potentially active vol volcanoes right now. Uh, we know that at the equator, uh, there is a rift zone that has hotspots. And when I put everything together for me, again, you have a number of elements that are converging to point towards volcanic activity. So if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that you can make phosphine and spew it into the atmosphere of a planet just with volcanism. You can do it with geology, not biology. And that's possibly an explanation here? Well, you know, we, we have to look into, we don't know so much about uh, Venus volcanism, but there are a number of studies on Earth that are looking at the Earth's prebiotic 
chemistry, for instance. And, and uh, to make those phosphates, you have to go back to uh, the original magma on Earth and make it you know, work through geological processes before life becomes life. And so I think that what we're seeing, or at least my inclination is to think that we are seeing volcanic processes, and we're going to learn a lot about the magma and the structure of this volcanism on Venus. You know, there is a Californian company, Rocket Lab, that's planning to fly a mission to look for life in the clouds of Venus in 2023. Uh, That's pretty soon. Are you aware of that? Uh, Do you think uh, they might succeed in doing this? I do actually know a number of uh, colleagues who are involved with uh, a a series of ideas of of concept that are extremely interesting. And, uh, you know, short of getting the answer from the magma at the surface, I think this is the best proxy because when you get to the altitude where those aerosols are being observed, they are in an altitude where the atmospheric pressure and the temperature are very, very close to what we have here on Earth. So it's not going to be an issue for them to survive uh, for those missions, balloons or airplanes, whatnot. And it would be fantastic to just be able to sample or analyze uh, even remotely with spectrometers the nature of those grains. Natalie Cabral, thanks so very much for speaking with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Natalie Cabral is a planetary scientist at the SETI Institute, where she is director of the Institute's Carl Sagan Center. Well, very exciting news, Seth. I know that scientists have to be skeptical about these sorts of things, but uh, the story is quite interesting. Well, it is indeed. I mean, is this going to be the first confirmed detection of, uh, you know, life beyond Earth, or is it going to be like so many claims in the past Interesting, but turns out to be, you know, we've been misled into thinking it's life when it's, in fact, something else. Well, how is the argument shaping up so far, Seth? Well, I mean, the way I see it is these people spent a lot of time trying to find the perfect biomarker. In other words, you know, some element where you can say, if you find that, you found life. I think all that is really solid. But, of course, the thing that uh, Natalie Cabral pointed out is that nature is clever at cooking up ways to cook up stuff. And this phosphine may have just been cooked up in a volcano on Venus. And, uh, you know, they would be the first ones to say, okay, at least we learned something from that. Although the authors of this paper say that they tested every abiotic possibility they could think of, surely volcanism was one of them. Well, you would think so, because that has fooled people in the past. Volcanoes can produce things like, well, methane, for example, and that's found on Mars, and, you know, people are reluctant to say that's due to biology. But to say that they've thought of everything doesn't mean they've necessarily tried out everything. As I say, the universe is a big place. Even Venus is a big place, and it's doing chemistry experiments all the time. Well, Seth, I know that you're a big fan of science fiction, particularly that that involves aliens um, on the red planet, that is Mars, do you think that this news could propel Venus into the spotlight of science fiction and maybe the Venusians will become our new favorite alien? Yeah, well, you know, that's an interesting thing, Molly, because indeed, it's kind of funny in a way that Mars has gotten all the attention. But, But I have to tell you, Molly, there was a film. I doubt you've seen it. I doubt that many people have seen it. It was called Zontar Thing from Venus. It was one of the worst films I've ever seen. I got to tell you that, too. <laughs> and what, what, what was Zontar like? What was the thing that came from Venus? Well, he looked just like the guy down the block. That's the thing. I mean, this was such a cheap film that Zontar, our thing from Venus, looked like Bob from three blocks away. All right, Keith. So you've got a little friend on Venus. What does he want from us? Has he got a name? Or is it just an it? Or maybe it's a she. I'm sorry you don't believe me, Kurt. He knows exactly what he wants, and he's about to make a move to get it. And although his name is untranslatable into any known Earth language, it would sound something like Zontar. (laughs) 
Well, the idea of microbial life floating in the atmosphere of Earth's cousin has itself been floated by researcher David Grinspoon. This will force people to take seriously the plausibility of a cloud biosphere on Venus, which is something I've long pushed. Next, a scientist who has devoted much of his career to studying Venus, a scientist who we suspect must have a big smile on his face these days. This episode, Life on Venus, on Big Picture Science. We began this episode talking to MIT scientist Clara Souza Silva about the nature of phosphine gas, but we hadn't yet discussed the fact that the team had detected it in the Venusian atmosphere. Now we'll hear her reaction to that. I'm mostly very excited, but I'm also extremely skeptical. As someone who's been trying to get this to happen my whole career, I'm obviously really invested in this discovery, but I do think that life should be a last resort explanation. And so I think it's more likely we got something majorly wrong than we found life. But we have done our very best and we're very clever, dedicated people working really hard to find alternative explanations. Was Venus on your short list of planets that might produce phosphine? Was this a surprise or was this pretty much what you thought if we were to find phosphine anywhere? Absolutely a surprise. I would love to say, oh yeah, I thought about Venus before. It was on my list. Next thing I was going to check. I didn't even consider it. I didn't consider anything nearby. This was all thanks to Jane Greaves, who's a professor at Cardiff and who is the leader of this project and the person who initially detected the first signal of phosphine on Venus. And I'm extremely thankful for her bravery and ingenuity to look for phosphine on Venus. While the news that scientists have detected phosphine gas in the atmosphere of Venus is new to some, the idea that Venus might have some biology in its atmosphere is fairly old. Carl Sagan suggested the idea in a paper in the journal Nature in, wait for it, 1967. In the many decades since, planetary scientist David Grinspoon has maintained that Venus was his number one choice for seeking life outside Earth, So we asked him, David, are you feeling vindicated? Well, in a sense, yes, this does feel like vindication. Not in the sense of we've definitely found the evidence. My my Venusians are real. My my imaginary Venusian friend who knew (laughs) is real. But in the sense that this will force people to take seriously the plausibility of a cloud biosphere on Venus, which is something I've long pushed. Uh, It's going to be uh, very visible, the question, can there be life in the clouds of Venus? And, and, you know, a lot of people will come up with reasons why they think there can't, but it's, it's not something that can be ignored. So in that sense, it does feel like vindication. Now, whether it's actually evidence of life on Venus, I'm not going to pop that champagne bottle I'm saving for that quite yet. But but you've been promoting this idea that we should be looking to Venus. I mean, Mars gets all the attention, but Venus is, well, it's a little closer. It's a little closer to our size as a planet as well, and yet it's been ignored. Why do, why do people ignore Venus? What's the bad rap that uh, Venus has? Yeah, well, I mean, if you think historically, uh, before the space age, Venus was thought to be a very Earth-like place. And then at the very beginning of the space age, we sent Mariner 2, the first successful spacecraft to another planet. And what did it find? It found that Venus is so hot on the surface that there's no way that any Earth life could live there. And so it was sort of a fall from grace that maybe it hasn't recovered from as Venus got this reputation as the deadly planet where, you know, the last place you look for life. And that is certainly true about the surface. 
But as we studied Venus more, we learned that, you know, not only is the surface interesting because it's geologically active, but that activity fuels a lot of interesting chemistry and activity up in the atmosphere. And we learned that the clouds are another realm of Venus that it turns out are much more moderate in their conditions. And as uh, I've been arguing for a long time, are not just moderate, but are promising in the sense that there is interesting chemistry happening there that could be the kind of thing that life sort of surfs on, just as on Earth, life kind of surfs on the geochemical cycles we have here. So, you know, I think the bad rap comes from that we think of the surface of a planet as where life should be, and the surface of Venus is not where any self-respecting organism wants to try to evolve. So, David, if there are floating life forms uh, at high altitude above Venus, you know, how do you picture them? What, what kind of organisms might those be? Well, we're probably talking about bacteria, single-celled, uh, simple organisms. Why do I say that? Well, generally, when we think about finding life elsewhere, we start with the idea of bacteria. If you look at the history of life on Earth, the, for most of the history of life on Earth, it was just bacteria. So we imagine in most biospheres, there'd be a long stretch where that's the dominant or the only life form and then complex life may be something that happens later on some worlds. And in particular, if we're talking about an aerial environment, it's a little bit easier to imagine very tiny organisms, which are, you know, of a size that could be blown around in the winds up there. You know, however, one has to say, we, we don't really know much about aliens. And at least uh, there are some ideas out there. Uh, Carl Sagan used to have this idea of uh, this very imaginative picture of life in the clouds of Jupiter, where there'd be these more macroscopic organisms that had like, had evolved float bladders and can, could control their buoyancy and so forth. So, so who knows? I wouldn't, entirely rule out more complex organisms in, in that kind of environment. But I'd, I'd be very, very happy to start with the assumption that it's probably just bacteria and to focus our search on that option. So how would you rate this latest uh, discovery, phosphine, on Venus? Is it, you know, sort of like squiggles seen with a microscope in a Martian meteorite? Or is this a little less ambiguous when it comes to indicating life? Well, if this is the real deal. And I mean, if the phosphine is, is really there and I'm, I'm not an observational astronomer and there are others more qualified to assess that part of it. But as far as I can tell, they've, they've done it right. And this is a, a, a credible claim. And if that holds up and there really is phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, then I think it, it, it's a legitimate uh, biosignature candidate. And just to put it in perspective, I think it would be a more compelling biosignature than the methane we found on Mars, because like methane on Mars, it's anomalous. It's something that shouldn't be in the atmosphere. It should go away by natural chemical processes, and therefore, uh, there must be a source. But unlike methane on Mars, it's very hard to imagine a non-biological source. So on, on Mars, it's, you know, yeah, it could be bugs, but it could be uh, chemical reactions under the surface making methane. It's, it's much harder to make phosphine in an atmosphere. You know, I'm sure a lot of clever people will apply themselves to this question. Maybe they'll come up with some other way to make it. But at this early point in our awareness of this announcement, it seems to me like potentially a very solid uh, biosignature and one that, uh, you know, either we have to explain away or we have to accept. And, um, you know, it's, it's just tremendously exciting. Well, well, let's go back, as they say, to those golden days of yesteryear and consider what uh, Venus might have been like four billion years ago when it was still fairly young. Uh, it doesn't have oceans now for obvious reasons. It's, they've all been boiled away, but it presumably did then. I mean, it got, it got water too in the early days of the solar system. So, uh, what, what happened? Why did, it, why did these oceans boil away, assuming they were there? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot, of course, that we don't know about the early history of Venus. And one uh, thing you'll get tired of hearing me say is that we need more missions to answer all these questions. But um, our best ideas about the earliest history of Venus, based on the evidence we do have, are that it was a much more Earth-like place, and it probably did have oceans when it was young. And a really interesting question is, how long did those oceans last for? And recently, models and studies have been pushing in the direction of thinking that they probably lasted much longer than we used to think. There was this idea that maybe very early on, Venus was an Earth-like place, but there was this runaway greenhouse where the oceans boiled off 
in a primordial ancient past and Venus has been sort of a hellhole ever since. But it turns out when we apply really good climate models to Venus, the GCMs, the general circulation models, the same kinds of models we use to predict climate on Earth, and we simulate this disappearance of the Venus oceans, that they last much longer than we used to think. And our best ideas now is, you know, we still don't know, but, but it's looking much more plausible that Venus could have had surface oceans for most of its history. And the loss of oceans could have been recent, which for a planetary science scientist doesn't mean last week. It means maybe only a billion years ago. <laughs> so, so Venus could have had what we consider a habitable surface environment for, for much of its history. And then the, the intriguing question is, what happened to that life when the surface uh, you know, sort of went bad? And one possible answer is uh, maybe it migrated up to the clouds. Now I have to say, when I step out in my backyard and I look up, I don't see a whole lot of life except for the uh, occasional bird. I don't see green clouds or anything like that. Uh, and, and wouldn't any life up there immediately, well, immediately, very quickly, just fall back down to the surface where it would get scorched to death? Yeah, those are good questions. So, um, you know, my colleague, Chris McKay, in response to my idea about cloud life on Venus, he says, well, why aren't the clouds green on Earth? <laughs> you know, if life can live in clouds, then why aren't our clouds full of life? And one answer to that is that, strangely, compared to um, the clouds of Venus, the clouds on Earth may not be as habitable in the sense that clouds here are discontinuous and ephemeral and they come and go. It's not a stable or long-lived environment. On Venus, the clouds are global and permanent and continuous and really deep. It's a 10-mile thick layer of clouds. That's deeper than the ocean on Earth. So uh, it's a stable and huge environment. So it may be that the clouds on Venus are more suitable for life than the clouds on Earth. So if there is this 10 mile thick layer of floating microbes in the atmosphere of Venus, what, what are they gonna chow down on? And what, what's up there for them to eat? What, what would you eat if you were a microbe up in the clouds of Venus? Well, there are a group of elements we consider essential to life, certainly to life as we know it, um, the biogenic elements. And we, we jokingly call that CHONSP, which stands for carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur. It's easier to say chomps. But, <laughs> but anyways, all of those elements are present in the uh, cloud environment of Venus. And then there are also energy sources. There's both radiative energy, uh, sunlight, and there are um, mixtures of chemicals that a, a life form could take advantage of to extract energy. So one thing we've learned about life on Earth is that it's, it's very uh, sort of resourceful um, or it takes advantage of, or like they say in Jurassic Park, life finds a way. You know, if there is an energy supply and a supply of nutrients, uh, and a stable environment, it's tempting to think that something would evolve to solve that survival problem. So I think that, you know, until we go and explore that environment more carefully, that this idea has to at least be on the table. And when we find something really striking like this phosphine gas that demands an explanation and at least is a possible biosignature, it just heightens the need to go back there and, and really explore and understand what's going on in that environment. David Grinspoon, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Oh, thanks a lot. Always a pleasure, Seth. David Grinspoon is a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute. Well, Seth, as we review the interviews and the conversation in the show, what is the big picture? And maybe one of the, the answers to that is there isn't a bigger picture, is there? Well, no, potentially there is no bigger picture. Well, I mean, you know, one, one can uh, become hyperbolic here. But indeed, you know, we keep waiting to have that conclusive discovery of life beyond Earth. And this, this is a good candidate. Is this the most optimistic that you felt in your years of doing this, um, that scientists have come upon a, a signal that is so robust and so tied to life itself that it is very nearly the discovery of alien life itself. Well, Molly, I mean, <laughs> I think I've gotten excited about all the <laughs> the previous claims. I mean, I, I, I can remember when the Viking lander 
uh, landed on the surface of Mars. And the first reports coming back from the, the you know, robotic experiments on board were that, wow, there's a life here. Well, and it turned out, you know, a couple of months later, you know, people said, well, probably not. And then there, there was the Martian meteorite in 1996. That was a big story. And, uh, you know, we kind of believed it. There was the wow signal. We found the aliens. And then in 1997, we picked up a signal and we thought that was it. I think I believe it every time. And uh, so the thing that I've learned is to be cautious. Does the fact that they have such a, a strong signal of phosphine and that it they've eliminated so many abiotic possible origins for the gas make you feel that this is a stronger piece of evidence? Well, one thing I'm not so uh, skeptical about is indeed the detection of phosphine. Right. If you look at their paper and, you know, you look at the, the spectral plots that they got from these radio observatories, there's no doubt that there's a signal there. I mean, I don't think that the presence of phosphine can be argued away. But the possibility, such as, you know, we heard from Natalie, that volcanic action could also produce phosphine, you know, that, that's something you have to take into consideration. And, and I note that the, uh, the press release from the magazine Nature did not mention life as a possible interpretation of this result. So they too are being cautious. I mean, people have been burned maybe once too often. But if we stay optimistic, I know we have to stay skeptical as scientists and journalists, but if we were to be optimistic and this were evidence of alien life, what would your reaction be? How significant is that story? Well, certainly this would be a huge news story. Uh, I've even asked journalists about that, and they say, yeah, yeah, this is going to be big, big, really big. <laughs> and for sure, I, I think, in fact, it would mark a kind of a, a change in the history of uh, Homo sapiens in a way. It's going to be before the discovery of life beyond Earth and after. And this could be it. I mean, it could be it. Well, we couldn't do this show without the intelligent life that floats behind the scenes. Senior producer Gary Niederhoff and assistant producer Sarah Derwin are those floating bodies. Thank you to both of them. I am executive producer of Big Picture Science, Molly Bentley. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit education and research organization that investigates, among other things, the extent of life beyond Earth. I'm the Institute's senior astronomer, Seth Shostak, and a big thanks to our listeners and our Patreon supporters. This episode of Big Picture Science is called Life on Venus. 